Hi, welcome to Indie ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Anna East Soto, and she's going to tell us about her near death experience, which was just a couple years ago. Yes. Okay. So you start wherever you like and take as long as you like. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Ana Isoro, and um, this is my near-death experience, my NDE. Um, on September 16, 2021, um, I, was, I was not feeling sick. I was not feeling any symptoms. Um, but unfortunately, um, when I went to the hospital um, for just a stomach ache that I was having for four days, um, my doctor had advised me to go to the emergency room thinking it was my appendic appendicitis. Um, my Spanish is going to come through, by the way, a couple of times, and I'm going to struggle. Was you undergoing cancer treatment at this time? No, not yet. Oh, I didn't okay. know I had cancer. Okay, okay. This um, is before so, that. Okay. Yeah. So I had called my, um, it was September 16. I had called my doctor to let her know that I was having a stomach ache. It was uh, for about four days, and it was a, bit, a little bit concerning. Um, it's just a stomach ache, though. And because it was on the weekend, the nurse was the one that responded and advised me to go to the emergency room. So I went to the emergency room. They did a CAT scan, um, normal routine for stomach aches, and they noticed that I had a mask. Um, I'm in room number six. Um, all of a sudden, I hear the doctor that's in charge of my case talking to surgeons and oncologists saying that the patient in room number six um, had a mass that was discovered in the CAT scan and it looked like possible lymphoma. So I looked up and I noticed that that patient was me. So I got scared. And then all of a sudden, like six different um, like medical teams like came into the room and um, they said I had to go get a they, I had to get a bio biopsy because the the mass shape was concerning. It had the shape of lymphoma. Um, if it didn't come back positive for cancer, that it, they would just leave it alone because I had no symptoms other than the stomach ache. So after I, I had the biopsy, um, they it unfortunately came out that it was lymphoma and I was on stage four already. And the oncologist, based on his experience and knowledge, said that I had three months to live if I didn't underwent chemotherapy immediately. Um, I was hoping for it to just be once a day, but it ended up being 24 hours a day for five days a week. And then disconnected for two days, to, for two weeks to be able to recover. Um, I had to do six rounds of that. And because it, it's called RCHOP, the regimen. And because um, it was accu accumulative, that's my Spanish right there, accumulative, um, the more chemo I got, the worse it became, the, the more symptoms I was, I would get. Um, the first, second, third uh, round of chemo, I didn't, I didn't feel anything really, um, just the normal side effects, uh, nausea, headache, uh, drowsiness, just fatigue. Um, but then the fourth and fifth round, I started to feel very sick. I didn't say anything to my family, so when they watch this video, they'll, they'll, they'll see that. Um, I didn't tell them anything about the very serious side effects. I only told them about the normal ones, the obvious, the, the nausea, vomiting, all that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so on my fifth round, after I got disconnected, I knew that I was going to feel sick after because I never felt sick when I was on the medicine. I always felt sick after. Um, the next morning after, I went upstairs to my dining room. My kid's father was there. He said that he was going to go get breakfast. This was on a weekend. He normally does breakfast for everybody on the weekends. Um, so, but before he left, he felt that he needed to go use the bathroom first. So he went and did that. While he was in the bathroom, I remember I told him, he's an EMT. So I said, Gabriel, if I ever become really sick from this, I need you to be there and don't let these doctors stop from bringing me back. Or you bring me back because you have experience in doing that. So he, I remember that my last breath, after I started to feel very sick, I started to feel very um, like weak. Um, I, I just thought it was the side effects of the chemo. Um, but then I, I, after I started to feel really weak, I called him up. I said, Gabriel. Um, so he came close and that's all I remember. After that, that's when the experience started. Um, I still remember that I went to this, it was a dark place. It was all dark. Um, I don't know if you've seen Stranger Things. I haven't. That, 
No, there's mm. there's a scene when when she's in like all the very uh, a very dark surrounding, like a very empty room. So I was in an empty basically. I noticed that in front of me there was like a like a black curtain, and it was ripped up through those holes, like through the rips of that curtain. I was able to see a very very bright light. Now what what interests me about this is that I looked down because I knew it was me. I recognized it was me, but I couldn't see my body. At that time, I didn't care whether I was fat, whether I was skinny, whether I had a body or not. My interest became in finding out where that light was coming from in between those holes of that curtain. Or so I, I describe it as a curtain, but it was like in front of me. So when I got closer to the holes, I was able to see it became like earth. It was like, like everything was high in contrast, almost like metallic high in contrast, but it wouldn't bother my eyes. Um, I started to hear these little kids laughing. And I have my kids. I have a really tough, like, big bond with my kids. But these little kids' laughter, my kids can't top it. The laughter was so peaceful. It filled me up so much inside that all I wanted was to find who was, where that laughter was coming from. So when I saw this place, right, it was grass. And the grass seemed like it was cut by hand with scissors because it was perfect. It looked like a carpet. No, no stains, no dried out spots, no brown spots, nothing. It was perfect. And then there was um, trees and there was nothing else. It was just nature. The only thing I noticed that was man-made is like um, the seesaw. I don't know. Am I saying it right? Right. Uh -huh. That seesaw. So there was kids there between the ages of five and six. Um, I noticed two of them specifically. One of them was a little boy with dark black hair. And then the other one was a little girl with two pigtails and she looked like me when I was little. I couldn't see the little kid's face, the little boy, but I was able to see the little girl. She kept staring at me, but her, her stare was like a surprise stare. Like I wasn't supposed to be there yet. I didn't care though. I didn't, I, I remember that I didn't miss my kids. I didn't miss my family. I didn't miss anything. And I love my life. I love my job. I love my kids. I love my family, but I did not miss anybody. I was not trying to come back. I was just trying to find this laughter and these little kids and this place that gave me so much peace and made me feel like I was going to be okay there. So um, I kept looking at this girl and then all of a sudden from like very, very far away, I hear somebody say, Anae! like my name real loud. It sounded like my kid's father. And that's when I came back. When I came back, I was already at the hospital. Okay. So your husband had got you there or he called the squad or? Yeah. So um, after I asked him, he said that he brought me to the hospital. Um, he said that he had put his hand right here. And that after he did that, that he saw that I just kind of left. And like my whole body just like empty. And that's when I'm assuming that that's when I was leaving. Um, like right now from that experience, um, I'm not scared. I'm not scared at all because I loved it there more than I love it here. Although I'm not, you know, like, I don't want to go, but I, it was very, very peaceful. What's your cancer looking like now? I'm sorry? Your cancer. What's that situation for you now? So the first cancer was stage four. Unfortunately, two years later, June 6th um, of last year, I was diagnosed with follicular cancer again. Um, it was a relapse. Uh, the only difference is that this time it was stage one. So I had to undergo um, radiation instead of chemotherapy. And thank God that now I don't have anything. They just did a um, cat, uh, PET scan in February, and it came out that I don't have anything. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Dodge that bullet. <laughs> Two bullets then. So I had the, the treatment that I went, um, I, I didn't just do our chop regimen. They also had to give me another treatment called car -T. Um, that's basically where they take uh, mother's house, they send them to the lab and then like they train them to like uh, detect cancer and then they put them back in the patient's body and it, the, the, the cells like it wraps up around the cancer and it kills it. But the only risk about that is that they said I only have 40% chance of making it through a lie. Oh, what's it called again? It's called CAR T. CAR T. Yeah, C-A-R slash T. Huh. They, so, I think 
I think yeah. I remember they, they discovered that in 2017 is when they came up with that treatment. Oh, huh. that's amazing. Yeah. They can do that. Yeah. So what did you think when you came back about having been there? Now you're back. I was sad. Yeah. I was sad. I did it again. My family doesn't know this. They're going to find out. Um, I was sad. I, I was not trying to come back. I, it, was, it was very sad to feel so full of life. And so like, and, and have to come back to know, noting like no, that I have cancer. I didn't want to leave that happy place, that peaceful place to have to come back to treatment and believing that I was going to die. I think who do, you th who do that, you think those kids were, that boy and that girl? Any idea? Um, I think that little girl was me. Because what's interesting, right? Um, when I, I I'm a believer, I'm just not really into like attending church and stuff like that. I don't really know the Bible much like that either. But um, when I was when I was talking to my friend, that's the wife of a pastor, my pastor. I consider him my pastor. Um, she said to me that. When I told her about it, she said that the little kids, that that's what it says on the Bible. But I didn't know that, that when we, that when we die, that we go back to being kids or something like this, she was saying. So, but I didn't know that. So it was interesting that although I did not know that, that I was on the Bible, when I, when I left my body, that's what I was able to see. So now I always state, and I quote, I believe not because of what the Bible says or what my pastor says. I believe based on what I saw and what I remember. So that from that little girl's perspective, she would have been seeing what she looked like older when she looked at you. Yes, 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 that's right. And I feel that that's why she was staring at me. What about the little I, boy? Any thoughts there? I, I, don't, I don't know who that is. Okay. I still don't know. The only the only thing I can say and I can compare it to is that a month before that, my brother got killed and um, he was on his way to his girlfriend's house and a car hit him. And that his body was broken into like 10 pieces. And I was the one that had to recognize his body by seeing the picture that the detective showed me. I, I saw a picture of his head on a table. And that really yeah. traumatized me. Yeah. So I feel like that little boy could have been him because. But then I wasn't able to see. He wasn't able to see me because I wasn't supposed to be there yet. But then my vessel, my little kid vessel was able to recognize me and was looking at me surprised because I wasn't supposed to be there. So you saw grass, you sh saw trees, you saw the seesaw, and you saw children. And these two children seemed like zero, or at least the girl seemed like see you. Yes. It, it just, it looked just like earth. It didn't feel like it was like the sky or, or, or heaven or anything like that. Just, it just, the only, the only thing I can compare to it feeling, feeling like heaven was the peaceful feeling of it. Was there any sound? No. The what I can say is that the laughter that I heard, um, when I looked at the kids, their their lips weren't moving. So it was more like we were connecting through emotions. So um, like um, you're able to see somebody like that. I was able to connect through with that little girl with the, those little kids through the through feelings and emotions because I was able to find them. I was able to find that they were the ones laughing, but their lips weren't moving at all. Were there a lot of kids or? There was a lot of them, but then the ones surrounding those two little kids that I was able to focus on just seemed very blurry when I can, when I think back on it. Okay. So no kind of information coming in, explaining anything or nothing saying you had to go back or no. Yeah. Okay. It was the little girl. It was the little girl that was looking at me like, okay, I know you're me, but you're not supposed to be here and you have to go back. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that because my kid's father was the last one I heard, it's the reason why a powerful being or something was able to use him to wake me back up. Although he wasn't next to me because I, when I woke up, the doctors were there, not my kid's father. Did you tell anybody right away what you experienced or was you afraid to? I was afraid to. I've always been afraid to. Um, it was actually my older daughter that encouraged me to uh, put that post on TikTok to possibly help somebody else going through the same thing. Um, I've always been scared to tell people my experience and then they look at me crazy because um, I know that scientifically they'll say like, well, the brain releases these chemicals and it makes you hallucinate. But 
I, I, I know I wasn't hallucinating. I, I know what I was seeing. It was very clear and right there. You and already had, you'd already had a TikTok channel at that time? Yeah. Yeah, what I did. What is your TikTok about? What do you? I post a little bit of everything. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just okay. Uh, cooking. I basically just try to I um join social media to like kind of be hip for my kids because I have teenagers. Okay. <laughs> so I have a, I started a TikTok to be able to see their accounts and see what they're posting. Oh. Um, so I started posting myself. Did you know who that person was? I didn't know who they were that emailed me and said I should have you on. Did you know them or? No, I don't. Okay. I don't know them at all. She inboxed me and she's like, hey, I know you don't know me. I'm a stranger, but I wrote this email and they, I don't know if it's a female or a male. Um, they sent me a, a copy paste of the message that the email that they sent to you. Okay. And then asked me for an email for you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. They told me to find you on TikTok. And I said, I'm not on TikTok. So can you get me an email? So I was happy they did. Uh, me too. I appreciate it a lot that they did that. So you, have you talked to your family since then? about any of this or no not really okay. no <laughs> how do you I feel should know. huh i should though how do you feel when you remember it um it's like a roller coaster i feel good but then i don't want to remember it too much um because realistically in life as you know as any other human being we're gonna face crazy stuff that can lead our minds to thinking crazy. So when I think crazy, based on whatever I'm having in my real life, I feel like I want to go over there. And realistically, that's not a good thought. So it's like, a, it's a roller coaster. I remember feeling that way early on. Like I didn't, like it was crazy. So I didn't want to let my mind go there because I couldn't yeah. make sense of it or didn't know where to put it. When I had mine, I didn't think it happened to anybody else. So did you know what a near-death experience was when this no. happened? No, have I you don't. you watched very many since then to find out what other people are experiencing? I have, yeah. I just kind of do it quietly because I don't. I just don't want anybody thinking, you know, oh, this girl is crazy because in reality, I'm not. Right. So it's it's like, a, again, it's like this experience is, is a complete roller coaster. You got to really pick and choose who you say it to because not everybody's going to take it in like an interesting way. Yeah. Well, you, you might be surprised. A lot of us are that we don't get the flack, the, you know, the, the rolling of the eyes or, you know, that we think that we would get. I at least I know I was. I was surprised. I was really afraid people would come out and say this and that and, and it wasn't really i mean yeah. back when i first told mine before anybody ever heard of indy back in 1986 they'd just look at me straight <laughs> and walk <laughs> away like they didn't want to say about that but then you know a long time later when people started to realize what an nde was like we you know you have that opportunity now that these people are going to know oh i know what that is you know that's a common thing yeah and I I what if like based on every of uh, everybody um else's experience I would have wanted to like okay get some kind of message or something to bring back <laughs> but I didn't I didn't and I guess it's still okay because I still had that experience and not everybody gets to have that experience and come back to talk about it. Have you ever wrote it down and see how, what all details you can recall? I have and also I tried drawing what I saw. But then every time I draw it, it, again, it just felt really good there. So I really try not to touch that experience too much. I imagine when it's that beautiful and that laughing yeah, the children, I mean, that it, it would be hard to go there and then come back to what you were thinking, what you were dealing with, you know, normal life. Yeah, I feel like. So I, I've heard a lot of people saying like the gate, gates of heaven and gates to heaven and all stuff like that. I feel like in heaven, there's really nothing man-made. Like there's no metal, there's no wood, there's nothing like that. It's all nature. Because as a believer, I feel like that's the only thing that, you know, that's what God made. That's what he created. So that's what's there. And when when someone passes, I don't feel like, I feel like they don't remember any of the family members or anything like that. Like, because I feel like there's no suffering there. And if you remember family members, then you'll miss them. And so that's why I feel like they, we don't remember anything. Well, they don't remember anything. Um, and then 
I wouldn't want to experience it again unless I'm going to stay there. I guess it's removed from most of us for a reason. You know, we live our lives. Nobody ever knows what death is like. It's a mystery. But then those of us that glimpsed it, you know, we do struggle with, gosh, I know what it looked like. Yeah. And Yeah. Yeah. Going, God, like going to, to, when I used to go to church and like every time I heard people talking about how heaven must look like, and I just look at them like, it is not like that at all. And it's like, it's just kids there. And again, like that confirmation from my pastor's wife telling me that that is what's written in the Bible, that then when we die, we become kids again. It's, it's confirmation that I was in heaven. And it feels good that when I passed, I went to heaven and, ne yeah. and not anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you seen the movie Heavens for Real? Um, is it with the little boy? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Okay, because that's the kind of what I was picturing in my mind when you talked about the playground. There's a scene in there where he sees his sister that um, mom miscarried. And he said, I have that's another right. sister. And there's that scene where I think there there might be a seesaw. I know there are swings, but the kids play on yeah, the playground. Yeah. yeah. And so that's what my mind what? went to. That is interesting. I didn't remember that. And like he saw his grandpa or something like that, right? Yeah, so he's thinking he's sitting on a tractor. Yeah. Oh lap. my God. And that is based on a true story as yes, well. Yes, it is. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, so that is a nice, I love the experiences that include children and not a lot of them do. Um, yeah. one, a friend of mine, his NDE experience, he experienced a lot of children and then these kids come up in different ages and just act like they just loved him so much. And he's thinking, I don't know these kids. And so later when he recovered from his issue and was telling his wife about it, she said, that coincides with the ages we had IVF that our kids would be now if they would have been born. So said, so like, those are our children. Yeah. And then, um, one guy, he used to have a local um, NDE group. And so his story isn't out there anywhere except for I made a little film and he was in it. It's Memories of Dying. And he's the last one of four I have in that film. And um, he had a little girl that wasn't supposed to live very long. She was born disabled. She could never communicate. And she lived to 18 and died. And later when he died in the hospital and, of course, come back, he saw her, she was playing and doing flips and running and he can run up and says, daddy, I love you. And he got oh. to see her like a normal child. And he just oh. cries, you know, the man just weeps when he tells it. And uh, I think her name is Natasha or something like that, Sasha. And uh, this is just, you know, I just, those are my favorite ones when it involves children. So. Yeah. I wouldn't mind experiencing again, experiencing that again. Um, as but again, as long as I'm gonna stay there, because <laughs> unless it's like a message or something that I have to go get and bring back. So I always thought in my mind, what if I'm the chosen one or something like that? So being able to come back, it's like, oh my god, that was interesting. <laughs> why, like, but then again, it's like, okay, so why was I able to come back, but other people have to stay? It's like it brings up a lot of questions. It does. It does. Yeah. Especially yeah. when you hear, I've heard once 7%, I heard 10%, 15%, you know, in the ears in the world, you know, it's like that small amount of people to come back that have died. Yeah. I wonder why, why do we get to come back and other people don't? Yeah. And, you know, now that we have the internet, everybody can share these where before yes. you didn't even know what an NDE was, even if there's books written and stuff for like 10 years before I even heard. The word I didn't follow what books are out there or any of that kind of thing. And so when I, you know, back when I started getting internet and, and I thought, okay, what do I want to search? Okay. So here's this machine. I can you know search anything I want. I, well, on them near death experiences I heard about, because I still wasn't believing mine was really an NDE. Mine was so different than everybody else. And with a few that I was here and are reading about. And, and so I realized Maybe mine was an NDE. So I found yeah, I always a website, NDRF, um, Near Death Experience Research, Dr. Jeffrey Long has. I think it was 2011. 
and when I first searched in NDE and it said, submit your story in big letters. And I just grabbed that thing and I started typing so fast and I didn't even spell check or anything. I couldn't wait to punch, you know, send, enter, whatever. Because, and I was like, there, I did it. I felt like, God, I did it. See, I did it. And I thought that would be all I would ever do. You know, I didn't know it would lead to everything else, but, but yeah. It's, I think that's how I was when I sent you the email with the uh, short biography, I'm like, with the, uh, the brief description of the NDE. I was like, okay, I'm not even going to check it. I'm just going to send it. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting. A lot of mistakes. To be able to release it when you're so scared, you're afraid people yeah. will say, and then you find, find a place that says, tell me. Yeah. Yay! Yes, <laughs> like yes, I'm allowed. yes. Yes. <laughs> I have been nervous all day. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. Um, I've been pacing back and forth. Like I'm, I'm expecting somebody to give birth or something. Oh. Um, I try to fix my hair all kinds of ways. I'm like, I was really nervous. Um, because again, like I'm, I'm scared of what people would think or say, but then again, I'm glad that I was able to find this community through the person that reached out to, uh, to me on TikTok because like, I'm not famous. I really don't have any followers. I just <laughs> post whatever comes to mind. If I'm cooking rice and beans, I'll post that. And then all of a sudden I get this message. I'm like, what? You're interested in my stuff? Yeah, and, you know, I haven't got very, I've been doing this three years on this, you know, indie TV three years ago since I started it and I haven't got maybe three or four people that contact me. I wish I got it every day they would contact me and say you should have this person on you know and so I love getting those when they tell me as somebody I should have on because I search for guests and you know and so I didn't have to search so he said hey have this girl I was like okay <laughs> I'm glad you allowed me to come on your channel I really appreciate it I hope you were not just nervous. You were nervous, excited, because I remember how I used to be being on. Yeah, yeah, uh, and nervous, excited. Yeah, I would not skip this experience for anything. Um, it, it was just that <laughs> I'm still a little bit nervous, but I'm trying. I, I'm getting. I'm starting to like calm down a little bit. I love that kind of excitement. It's like my favorite excitement in the world. Is like it surrounds about getting to tell my NDE or something. And I remember when I first started sharing my NDE a little bit, and then. Um, I met somebody on a Facebook group and I, and he mentioned that he's uh, friends with Lee Whitting and who has NDE radio. And I think it was like in 2016 and I was half joking and kind of shy to say it. So on a Facebook group, I said, well, will you ask him if I can be on his show? And he's, yeah, I'm headed there right now to go see him. I'll tell him I'm like, Oh my gosh, really? And when he <laughs> called me, Lee Whitting called me and asked to be Asked me to be on his radio program. It's internet radio. You might as well told me Oprah just called. I mean, I was so excited. I was like, oh my yeah. God, I'm going to be on ND radio. And so when I started thinking about, you know, name for my show, I thought, well, ND radio and I ND TV because the computers like TV nowadays, you know, we watch the YouTubes on our televisions and whatever. Yeah. So anyway. I have, um, I have a Facebook where I have a, good amount of followers there and I started to post on my story like oh my god I'm about to be interviewed about my NDE I don't know. but I didn't really want to say anything there again because of the followers that I have I didn't want them to think I was crazy I always thought okay I'll just go and possibly use the filter so they don't know that it's me go on Snapchat and speak about it a little bit so that when if they see me out there they don't know that it was me but I, I never did it I never had the pants to, <laughs> to speak about my NDE I hope you get to the point where I ended up getting to where you own it. Where like, you know, because I had to think for a long time, I had to convince myself, I don't want to say convince, I had to convince myself that it was true before I could convince anybody else. Because I had to make sure this was real to me. Because yes. I think, how then, I, then it came to the conclusion, finally, what other answer could there be? Then it was real. I wasn't out long enough to be asleep, to have start dreaming. I've never forgotten it. It's so real. So it wasn't just, you know, a fame of imagination. And with mine, it was, at, I, I drowned when I was five out of NDE. And then at 25, ectopic pregnancy died of internal bleed, NDE. And so that one was through the tunnel in heaven and stuff. And so when I come back, I'm in the wheelchair. My first thought was, what the hell was that? 
I was just in heaven accepting it. And now I'm back because I begged God to let me come back and raise my three little boys. And I was told the answer was no, it was my time. So when I got to come back, I'm so thankful, you know, that I got, because I was in heaven trying to accept that I would never go see my boys again until, you know, they're old or whatever and come to heaven. And I was really trying to accept it. And then I'm back, but then I thought, oh, wait, whatever just killed me is not fixed. So I've, I felt like, I always say like Cinderella, like I got like till midnight or something, a short a window of time to get my daughter to fix, my doctor to fix this, or I'm going to be dead for yeah. good. I felt like God did me a huge favor, letting me come back, give me more time to get this fixed. When my doctor come to examine me, he's like, there's nothing wrong, you're fine. He says, I told you, you know, I did ultrasound before in my office, both babies are in the uterus, right for twins, there, there's nothing wrong. You know, like I should go home and discharge oh. me. And I could not say, because it was 1986, like I could hopefully today, wait a minute now, huh? I was just in heaven. I was dead. So I, something killed me. So that means I'm going to die again if you don't fix me. But I uh -huh. couldn't say that. You know, I thought they'd put me in the psych ward. And so I thought I'm, if I go home, my husband will get good work in the morning and my boys will find me dead. And I'm not going to do that to them. If I'm going to die, I'll die here. And they'll just get the phone call. So um so I said well I'm not going home that's all I said and so he looked at me like I was weird as well make you feel better I met you so he did and so then um the next morning he come in and did ultrasound that's when he found I had internal bleeding fill my tire abdominal cavity cut up to my chest they rushed me into emergency surgery and you know do ectopic pregnancy they can't save babies at two months pregnancy you know but um so my and he saved my life because if I hadn't had that NDE, see, if I just passed out or if I just mm -hmm. died and then come back and not had any experience, I wouldn't have known. My doctor was full of it when he said I was fine. I knew there's no way I was fine because I was just dead in heaven. That means yeah. you're not fine. You're not, you're mm -hmm. not fixed. And I needed to get fixed so I could be here and take care of my boys, you know, and I couldn't. So, but so, yeah, it's like my NDE saved my life. Because yeah. it, like say I would have went on home and they had found me dead in the morning. I'd been the end of it. And so I got, you know, it's, people don't realize like you, you know, surviving cancer, how blessed we are to have uh -huh. the opportunity to raise our children that a lot of women don't get, whether it's cancer, ectopic pregnancy, car accident, you know, whatever that they yes. don't get to raise. Cause that's, I mean, I know you, you were enjoying where you were and you were happy there. And, 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 and a lot of people are like that. They like, like, I feel like I might make people feel bad because I was like fighting. No, uh, -uh. like nobody else is going to raise my kids. Yeah. And other people yeah. were like, they felt guilty because I didn't think about my kids. I just thought this is cool here. I'm going to stay. Imagine telling my kids this. Yeah, I didn't miss you guys when I was there. It's like, oh. so that's why I didn't say anything. Um, but then I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Mary oh. Neal was, uh, you know, nearest uh, uh, orthopedic doctor. I don't know if you heard of her. She was a kayaking accident. And um, she had a beautiful heaven experience and she thought all her kids would be just fine. You know, she just wanted to stay there. And she felt bad later that her kids would hear her say that. Like, didn't you want to come back for us? And she's like, oops, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I know, that, I know they're going to be asking that when they watch this. But I still remember, I wanted to also tell you that I still remember when I was like 11 years old, um, I was at a residential and um there was this game going on, like seven minutes in heaven or something like that. But I remember that two two other girls were pressing on my chest while I held my breath. So I had to hold my breath enough until I passed out. So when I pa passed out, I remember I was standing in front of again of a like a like a dark curtain. The only difference is that the light was only coming from one side, and then it was dark on the other side. And so standing in front of that curtain, I had to choose. But it wasn't like well, you know what? Based on everything I know, I'm going to the light. Like, it was really my deepest desire choosing for me. So, like, I always understood from that experience, like, I could sit here and say, I believe in God. I want to go to heaven. Um, I want to go, you know, and follow everything that says on the Bible. But then in reality, when I remember when I passed past that time when I was 11, first, I didn't know anything of the Bible. I didn't know anything of God other than Jesus was Jesus. And then, so, standing there, it explains to me that it's not us who choose where we want to go, the path we want to take, 
but then our deepest desire, like what's truly deep in there that you don't even know or think about um, is what chooses your path when you pass. So we got to sometimes like evaluate ourselves and truly see what it is that we have in our hearts, because that's what that's what I feel from my experience that chooses. And then the third time that I had an, the experience, I only went to one empty and then I was I, I, can't, I was brought back. That's yeah. after I did party. You only went what? I only went to like an empty. It oh, just empty. went dark. I was in New York at the hospital that was treating me. My I'm from Connecticut, so my kids were all the way in Connecticut, separate state. Nobody was close to me. Um, they had given me the CAR T treatment. I became very, very sick. My fever wouldn't go down. Um, they were literally planning on sending me to the ICU because I was becoming very sick. Um, I had to learn to talk, walk, do everything on my own again. That's why they called me a reborn. So I remember that time I um, I left again my body, but I only went to one empty. The, the, the space that I saw at first, when I first had the experience. And then after that, I heard my daughter, um, Tiffany, and my uh, my older daughter, Janalise, called out for me. Mah! Like in desperation, like something was happening to them. And that's what brought me back. And then after I came back, I, I started to argue with the doctors. I just let me go. I'm in New York. I got to eat pizza. I can't be at this hospital. And like a week later, they let me go. So that experience was after the first one you just told about the player. Play, the second one wasn't there. It was at a, a dark. It was. I think yeah. some people call that the void when it's just black and yeah, it's really there. You're just out of your body. And did how did you, that feel in that space? I, I just, I felt normal. I didn't feel worried. I didn't feel like I had to search for something. I just felt normal. Like it was okay for me to be there. I didn't, I didn't know what brought me there though. That I can say for every experience, the first one and the second one, I did not know what had brought me there. All I knew is that I wanted to find out what was next. Like what was beyond that, that black curtain. I think sometimes think that people watch a lot of these NDEs and I think in my mind, they must pick one. Okay, that's the death I want. Like, that's what they're going to have. But those of us that had multiple NDEs, it's not the same every time. Just because we had one experience one way doesn't mean when we die for good, that's what we're going to experience. It's going to be different. I mean. So, like, logically speaking, I can say when I think of um, NDEs, um, I feel my own personal opinion is not based on any fact at all. I feel that based on what we fill our brain with, the information that we fill our brain with is what is is what we're gonna see when we pass. Because those are that's what your brain is releasing in a type of way. I don't know if I'm wording it right. Yeah. Um, so that's why it's so important to fill our brains with as much positivity as possible so that we can have that positive experience when we when it's time for us to go. Yeah. Don't die in a negative mood, <laughs> in a bad no, mood. No, <laughs> at all, at all. Oh, no. Yeah, because my first one, the drowning at five years old, it was just all out of body. But I heard a female voice say, don't go yet. If they find you soon, you might go back. And so I was just this ghost girl just doing stuff and watching my family below and and things. So, and then, you know, oh. Uh, then later, after I had my second NDE, it wasn't long after that, I recalled that drowning NDE one night as I was with the night sky and it just like a big movie screen. The memory was so clear and it just like took me over and I watched it from front to back. It was like a movie trailer of it. And, and I was like, whoa, I, did I drown when I was little? And the bits and pieces of memories that will start coming back and Asked my mom, so I went to my mom's house the next day. Did I drown when I was little? And how did you find me? Because I didn't see the rescue. Like I was flying around town doing stuff, but in the country. And and then suddenly I was coughing up water down my brother's back because he's carrying my body. And she's like, how do you remember that? And I come to find out that, um, see, I was their sixth child, fifth of the living kids, because their firstborn died at nine months old. And my dad's family blamed her for neglect of that child. So she didn't want anybody to know that I had drowned in that pond because they'd all blame her. So it was never discussed. And my oh, sister wow. and brother that was there, you know, they had never said anything and I'd had no memory of it. It hadn't just, you know, come to me. And uh, this is, so she later remembered, she said, yeah, she 
noticed when she noticed I wasn't there, she asked my brother, where did you see her last? And made him keep diving down the water until he pulled me up. And then he's carrying my dead body up to the house. Wow. So started coughing up water down his back. And, and so they left me standing there on the road sick and they just went up to the house and I was so sick. You know, my belly was a tiny little kid, belly full of pond water and I was weak. And I had all the memories of everything that just happened. Wow. And I thought I was just flying, having fun. Why would I go up to that house? And because during the NDE, a voice had let me know my family didn't love me. And then they said, God sends children here to be loved. That's why he sends them here. And I said, well, you just let me know they don't love me. And you tell me that. And so now I'm back. I remember all of this. And I'm thinking, I know drowning really hurts, but I'm not going to fight it this time. I want to go back to that pond. And because I, I felt it was my right at five years old, didn't know the word suicide. I'm going to go back to that pond and I'm just going to let myself drown because I'm going to go back flying again. Like, why would I go up to the house that family don't love me? And then the voice I heard earlier that said, no, don't. If they find you soon, you might go back. She now appears in like this white shape of an angel, like a woman. And because uh, I start to walk back to the pond and she stops, she says, no, don't. So that's the second time she said, no, don't to me. She says, no, don't. And I said, why? You know, they don't love me. And she says, well, you'll have a lot of love someday. And I said, when? And she says, when you have your own family. And I said, where will I find it? And I think I was just trying to keep asking questions so she didn't leave me. I wanted her to stay. And she pointed right towards Belfry. And that's where I met my second husband, who was in my soulmate. And so, I don't know. It just seems like, who are these people that yeah. tell us these yeah. things on the other side? And, you know, oh, the, 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 with, with, the, with the twins, it was all tunnel, heaven, bright white light, God, Jesus, and all that. It was totally different. And so, yeah, but go ahead. What do you think? What do you make of it? I, I remember also when, now that you were saying about the voices and like the people that speak to us, when I, when I had the experience, when I was 11 years old, I still remember it was like, uh, it was a guy, it was a man's voice or something like it was because it was tough and deep. But all I, all I heard him say was, it's not your time yet. You got to go back. It's not your time yet. When I was 11, but then when I, when it happened recently, when I had the cancer, I didn't hear anybody other than the laughter. Man, what if, what if, what if he was there, but then he didn't say anything because I didn't listen the first time I went back. <laughs> Something like that. And who knows when our time is? I mean, that just mystifies yeah. me. Like, yeah. They it's know when our time because, is. That's amazing. Yeah. If, if you, if you, when you look at all the stories, like everybody's experience that had, that had an NDE. Um, they don't say it it wasn't your time yet. You got to come back at this time or it's not right. your time yet. You got to come back a year later. Right. They just say it's not your time yet. Right. So that's, that's very, very interesting. Imagine if we know how and when. Yeah. 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 That would be weird. Like yeah. we could go jump off a cliff. Well, we're not going to die today. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Like Welcome they, from they traffic. Well, I'm not gonna die today because yeah. yeah, it would be yeah. weird. Yeah. I wonder, I still wonder who they are though. It was it Jesus, was it you know, was it God? Was it a Holy Spirit? Was it a family member? Was it the father that I still don't know till this day? Because I still don't know my father. Um, was it my stepfather that passed? I don't know. I guess, you know, on the other side, time doesn't matter like at time here we have to go through this process it's apparently time doesn't matter and so they know when our time is because they can apparently see the future and the, know all our path like a lot of people have life review they see their whole life and then they're like maybe given these messages you this wasn't right or or you did good here or this was a wonderful thing you did and this, there's this judge you know, of what's good and what's bad and what they want us to learn. And another thing um, I've noticed is both NDEs, even though they were so different, both of them had these visions. This scene would just pop up like a TV without the TV, you know, just the scene. And it showed me something. And um, with the drowning, it was a vision of my past, just looking in this fishbowl. And it, it let me know oh, the fish that's bumping into me as I'm, you know, drowning in this water, they know something I don't, that I'm dead. Because I didn't get that I was dead at first. I thought, 
my parents lied to me. There's no such thing as drowning because I'm breathing now and I'm fine. Like, what was I afraid of? What was I struggling for? And then I had that vision of looking in this fish bowl and stuck my hand in. The fish was afraid of me. And I thought, well, how come these fish are bumping me? And then, oh, the fish know something I don't, that I'm dead. And I've looked on the internet. Do fish really know the difference between live things and dead things? I assume they do. Their animals seem to have that instinct, but I don't know. Just that it opens up this whole box uh, when you have an NDE of questions. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I, If I sit here and ask all the questions I have, I, we won't ever stop this video. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. And I keep wanting somebody to answer them. And I keep wanting some university just to focus just on NDEs and study these seriously. Like put us all under the microscope, lie detectors, yes. background checks, mental yes. health checks, do everything. And then take yes. the ones that you feel are credible and then go forward and study what they're saying. Because yes. I feel this is a, you know, they want to study space. They want to study the earth, you know, deep down in earth crust and everything. But here's this realm that exists all around. And they know that because I forget the exact words is like, we can only see a small percentage, you know, the surface, mm -hmm. the physical world, but they know there's this huge world unseen. Well, that's what we're talking about is the unseen yeah. world. There's this intelligence in there and, and why not study it as long as they're yeah. rolling their eyes at us the scientists yeah. that say oh impossible and those people are nuts yeah. and they don't believe in an afterlife that they think we're just wishful thinking really you know millions of people that have such similar stories from all over the world we all had the same type experience that's that's my question that's one of my questions it's like so if if it's not real like many scientists believe or many other people believe, then how come people that don't even know each other, don't even know each other exists, have similar experiences? And and a lot of them, like a lot of us speak about seeing kids and um, hearing them and like similar stuff. So how is it? How? How? It's like I can't even ask it. How? We don't know each other. We don't know each other's background. How do we have similar NDEs like that? It must be a real place that we go to. Yeah. And our stories don't change. Yeah. I, I even underwent, um, when I went to get checked out for my mental health, because when I came back, um, one of the things I wanted to make sure is that I was not, like my mind wasn't completely affected with the treatment that I was getting. And mm -hmm. that's what was making me see stuff. So I called my PCP and I was like, I, I need to get checked out. I need an evaluation. And I'm mentally stable to the point that I'm a CSO of the police department from where I live. So if I wasn't mentally stable, I wouldn't be able to pass all the examinations that we have to go through to be able to be a CSO. So I know that what I saw, it wasn't, okay, I have mental health. Okay, I was under the influence. Okay, I was hallucinating. No, it was not any of that yeah. at all. I mean, I used to be an investigator for children services. I was a primary counselor at a maximum security women's prison. I was a mental health social worker, state mental hospital, you know, on and on. You know, these things. If I was so crazy, how did I hold these positions? And I've never had a bad evaluation. I've never been fired, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Like, why? That's my question. <laughs> now, yeah. not to say I do, I do believe some people are lying. I mean, oh, we yeah. all have that natural instinct. When somebody tells yeah. us something, no matter what it's about, we're just like, I don't really believe this person. Yeah. I'm, I'm finding too many inconsistencies in their story. And they just seem to be one up on everybody or, you know, whatever it is, which we know they could, maybe they're not, but, um, but yeah, I'm sure there are. And, and some in the ears is like, I just really got to sell books. I just really got to sell books. I got to get my story out there and sell books. I'm like, really? Because I got to get my story out there and everybody else's story out there because I feel these are glimpses into God. I feel yeah. we can see God when we talk about these NDEs. We can find out, okay, the telepathic communication, the scene that you saw, the you know what I saw. Why did we see, you see this and I see that. And it's like, it's all designed mm -hmm. just for us. So yeah. They know we're going to come back. So it's like, what do they want to give us like this gift when we go back to help us forward? 
And yeah. if nothing else, you know, give people hope that death isn't the end. If some major disaster happens, they're going to know about these experiences. Maybe people have less fear. Yeah. They, oh, yeah. That, that was... People told that, you know, that we go on. So we're going to chill here. I don't know. Yeah, that, that was really one of my main goals to be able because I hashtag like our chat regimen and like chemotherapy. I hashtag all that um, because I remember when I was first diagnosed, I would go on like the Internet and search up other people undergoing treatment just to see their side effects and stuff like that. So I wanted my story to hopefully help somebody go, you know, feel more a little bit more comfortable about going undergoing this treatment and and knowing that in the case that god forbid something happens is you're not gonna you know it's not gonna be bad it's you're you're okay so just trust the process go ahead do the treatment and just be comfortable with it but honestly when i went through the through the whole treatment um i feel like it was more like a mental battle than anything because i didn't i want i didn't want to like die and normally when you hear cancer cancer and chemotherapy the first thing that comes to mind is i'm gonna die um, that just changed after I had the NDE. NDE. And it seems like people that have had NDEs, when they come back, they're healed of whatever yeah. it was. Like yes. mine, obviously, yeah. you know, I had to be had surgery to get, you know, ectopic pregnancy. You know, I couldn't live without surgery. But like, you know, with you, chemo, you end up being healed eventually. Yeah, other people have had like 2%, you know, chance of survival, whether it was from a heart attack, all their organs shut down or COVID or, or cancer, whatever it was, it seems like, I think being in that light has some kind of healing properties on our, on our, our bodies. Yeah. Yes. Cause we're, I, all, I, we're all healed when we come back. You don't yeah. hear NDE and then next week they die. Yeah. But sometimes I, 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 you do, I suppose. Like some people have recorded people having NDEs and then they in, they end up dying, but they want to get this story out. Yeah, well, I, I think so. So I wasn't, so again, like I was supposed to, they said that I had three months to to, to live. Um, and then they also said I, it was only 40% chance of making it through that treatment, the car T. So I I believe that I I was healed. Yeah, I, I was here. 40% chance. 40%. 40% chance. And I, I wish that I was able to like print out some pictures of my PET scan so that people could see the amount of cancer that I had in my stomach. It was between my stomach and my spine. It was it was really big. It looked like black circles all over my stomach. And then now after they did the PET scan again, there's nothing there. And I wasn't supposed to make it through. The professionals, the experts, I, I don't know if you're familiar with like the top five hospitals for cancer in the United States. I went to one of the top fives, MSK in New York in Manhattan, and they're all experts there. And they were all telling me, you have three months. So honestly, when they said that to me, um, I was on a telehealth appointment. I was standing in my kitchen. My kids were there. My best friend was there. My kid's father was there. Um, they heard the doctor because I said, I said to the doctor, you're not God. You can't tell me when I'm going to die. And she said, well, I'm not God. I'm trying to do something better than God. <laughs> so, and um, I said, so if I don't do this treatment that you're saying is, is only 40% of making it through, how long do I have to live? And that's when she said three months. So I remember, yeah, I wasn't supposed to be here for Christmas with my kids. So I said, you know what? If I'm going to die, then I'm going to die fighting. And I under the, I went the treatment. I know it's hard though. I mean, when you think of leaving your kids behind and I don't think there's anything, any worse feeling in the world. Oh no. Than, than thinking absolutely. about leaving your kids. Yeah, absolutely. Especially like when you have a bond as strong as it is, like my bond with my kids, I'm like, I can say I'm obsessed in a healthy way with my kids. I cannot be without them. I have been told by different family members, including my son, to go on vacation, to take some time. Because after I did treatment, I didn't like go to follow up with, wait a minute, I just was diagnosed with cancer. I underwent a whole treatment. And then after that, I just went to, straight to being a mom and to working and handling my life. So it's like, it was like a big punch. And sometimes I struggle. And my son tells me, go on vacation, take a week off. Um, you know, treat yourself, but I don't because every time that I think of going on vacation, I got to go on vacation with my kids. Yeah. So 
the the thought and the feeling of oh my god there's a possibility i'm gonna die like before i was diagnosed with cancer my um boss's daughter had just turned 12 years old and she passed from leukemia so i thought myself i'm like i have sinned i have done so many crazy stuff if that little girl didn't make it through i'm not gonna make it through So I was already ready, you know, I'm, I spent like $600 going to like a five-star restaurant to eat everything I could. Um, Cause I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm going to do everything that I wanted to do in my life. Um, even though I didn't go and now I'm left with debts and bills, but yeah, like, I'm like, she didn't make it through. I wasn't supposed to make it through. And now the fact that I'm here, that's definitely gone because the yeah. experts were saying no. Are you a police officer? I'm a CSO. So basically what a nurse is to a doctor, I am to a police officer. Okay. Okay. A CSO, what's that stand for? It stands for community service officer. Community service? Community service officer, yes. So what do My you goal do? Is to... Like, do you... Oh, go ahead. I'm curious. Though whenever there's like a disaster, whenever there is like a, a car crash, um, we do we attend the police officers. We also um answer nine one one phone calls. We just don't have the right to arrest. Okay. Interesting. Basically, so the department is saying they have all these officers, right? And there are certain calls that come through to the 911 that does not require a sworn officer to attend it. Like, for example, my cat is up a tree. Now you have a whole officer that could be attending a 408 call, which is like a life or death situation, um, handling something like a cat up in a tree. So that's when we come in and we handle those cases so that the officers can focus on the more serious ones. Do people really call about a cat up a tree? Yeah, sometimes. Do they? <laughs> Because they come down on the road, right? <laughs> yeah. That's what we say. That's what we say. Sometimes we just sit there so that we can, like, comfort them. Like, you know, it's okay. We go through. We try to not let anyone feel like their call is not urgent. Then something else to start when people feel like that. But, um, yeah, we, we still go. <laughs> okay. That's funny. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to add or discuss? Or been really no, inter um, interesting. Yeah, no, I just I I think I have to go back to church. <laughs> Are you uh, recording this for your TikTok as we talk? No, I, I'm oh. not. No. Oh, okay. I seen a thumbs up show up on your screen while going. That's okay. Yeah. Oh no 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 I'm not. Did it? There was a thumbs up. No. Yeah, earlier on. Yeah, it just showed up right on the side of your head. A big thumbs up. So I thought. No. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to share the video though. I'm going to okay. put it on, on all my social media platforms. Okay. Well, I'll get it ready now and uh send it to you later today. So you can oh, share it. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye.